our mic. Oh, not your mic, our mic. Okay, glad. Although it's not muting. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 11th episode of Like Clockwork. Uh, it's actually a really, really hot day here. I'm reporting from Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm very glad to introduce this lineup of filmmakers, um, artists, curators, who are going to be speaking with us today and sharing a topic that makes them tick. I am M. Woods, representing Chicago Filmmakers. And a couple of new things have, have come up at Chicago Filmmakers. Of course, we're just off of a very hectic screening schedule following the Onion City Experimental Film Festival. But we've also just announced a presentation with MUBI for June to celebrate Pride Month. So more information of that uh, can be found on chicagofilmmakers.org. And without further ado, I'm going to visually show our guests here so that they can all introduce themselves. And Zoe, I'll start with you. Amazing. Hi, everyone. My name is Zoe. My pronouns are she, her. I'm currently tuning in from Nice in the south of France, where I'm currently finishing a master's degree in contemporary art practices. Um, I'm super excited to be here with you guys today. I'm a contemporary visual artist. I work with video and textiles, creative writing, and I am also a curator and a programmer. I'm currently working with the online catalog Move em Cat for moving image artists and a variety smattering of collectives around, um, around Europe. And it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, we, we just had Stefano on the show too. So it's it's beautiful, all these things tied together as well. Stefano Vidaglio uh, from our previous episode, of course, is uh, a founder of, of Move Move Cat. Um, and I'll pass it on to you. Oh, Bruce, you, you got your microphone off. <laughs> These are the the troubles of, of modern technologies. Hey, Bruce. Oh, yeah, your mic is off. Excuse me. Thank you for waving me in. No, you're good. Okay. <laughs> you're good. I, I was rambling on about I, I'm, I, I'm Bruce Posner, but now I know I'm a he, him. I've never been designated before. So now I know what I've been and going to be. Although, you know, it's funny, walking around here lately, and we're up in the sticks near Hanover, in Hanover, New Hampshire, I'm right on Dartmouth College campus, is that um, finally in 2000 and whatever this is, 23, there's transgender things up the wazoo. And I grew up on Miami Beach, um, you know, for like 100 years ago, so that's nothing new. But what's new is in Hanover at the coffee counter at the donut shop. And it's just a mind twister. I should be completely there with whatever the pronouns are, uh, which I can't figure. So anyway, um, I make films sort of in private, and I you know, show films in public, and I've saved or preserved an awful lot of films, and I'm getting tired. So... Um, they're all over the world at this point, which is great, and I feel happy I can retire because I know that things are going to be safeguarded as long as there's some kind of moving image happening. Although I just spent a week at the Eastman House in Rochester, and I'm not so sure. <laughs> so anyway, hello. <laughs> and nice to Thank meet you. Thank you very Michael. much. I, I got very a nice to meet online you. story to tell about Aldo Tambellini at some point if we get there. Very good, very good. Yeah. <laughs> of course, uh, uh, Bruce is um, also a big part of the Harvard Film Archive, and so has a, has a tie to, of course, Alto Tambellini. Um, and I would love to uh, be able to talk more about that as well. Thank you very much. And yeah, yes, I will. I, I, because I'm, I'm the un... I, I literally, I'm, I'm, I, me, me, I, I. That, instead of he, me, him, it should be I, me. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Right, but um, I've been of late because I'm I'm seventy, so I'm like I really am thinking about retiring because my you know all the just the faculties are leaving me to you know get through the day, but um, I really did have a lot to do with the Harvard Film Archive being what it is now, 
um, in a very private way that nobody knew about. But great, I'm glad I did it. Anyway, I'm done. Sorry. Oh, very, very glad to have you on. Thank you so much. And Lori. Hi, I'm Lori Felker coming in from Chicago, corner of my bedroom. Uh, I am a filmmaker. I don't, I'm a lot. I'm a multi hyphenate filmmaker, artist, professor, uh, programmer, sometimes actor, cinematographer, whatever. Um, basically, if it has to do with cinema and I like you and I like it, the project, I'll probably say yes. And then I'll add something to my hyphen list. Um, yeah, and I'm just, I'm excited to be here. So I'm ready to chat with these lovely people. Awesome. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, this is going to be a really great show. Um, I would like to remind folks who are listening in, uh, the format of the show is that each one of our guests will present a topic of uh, their choice for up to 10 minutes or so. And then we will all uh, join together as I try to tie together somehow all of the myriad different things we're going to be discussing. That being said, we are going to start with Zoe. And Zoe, take it away. Hi. It's very exciting to get a chance to speak with everyone today. And I am bringing a topic that I think is just half-baked enough or in the process of baking that we will uh, hopefully have an amazing conversation about it. Um, and, and the sort of origin or the inspiration of this topic uh, originates actually from the, the year, the period of time that I first met M. Woods, which was in 2018. So it's also kind of a nice looping around temporally. Um, and <clears throat> it starts with the, the research that I was doing for my undergraduate thesis film, which was a uh, poetic documentary about a hysteria patient in uh, the 1800s in France. And a lot of the research that I was doing at that time was archival. I was going very deep into this woman's medical records, into uh, a lot of the um, hospitals around, around Paris. It was a very beautiful experience. And I uh, encountered something very interesting that has continued to exist uh, in, in a very lively way in my practice, which is um, the uh, the question of the unsayable of what cannot be uh, what cannot be spoken what is outside of language, and I'm going to articulate a little bit about what what I mean with that and. Um, and then I'm excited to hear about other people's definitions. Um, so I, uh, I did my undergraduate studies at Hampshire College, and I worked with a myriad of amazing professors there. I studied video art and psychoanalysis, and one of my psychoanalysis teachers was the incredible Annie Rogers. And she was the first person to introduce the idea of the unsayable to me and the way that uh, she speaks about it in her work and in her, her writings, which I, I recommend very highly, um, is something that originates from, say, an experience of trauma or grief that, uh, that sort of breaks our capacity to articulate with the shared language. And uh, a big part of the healing process is carving new modes of language. And so when I was studying for, uh, for my undergraduate thesis film, I encountered a very specific uh, mode of unsayable, uh, particularly in these archives where I was engaging with a historical figure that had been very highly overexposed by the medical voice, by the male voice um, of the doctors and the uh, nurses and the um, uh, the sort of investigational nature of their work on, on her. And so in exploring her life uh, with the film, I, I discovered that I wanted to tell her story, but I, I did not want to repeat the sort of exposing voice and the exposing mode of storytelling. And I, I wanted to actually kind of hide her and protect her and to engage her a little bit um, in this uh in this unsayable way. And so I, uh, I became very curious about the idea of using visual art. Sorry, I have a cat running around. I don't know if you can hear that, but um, she's very young and very excited. Um, 
I am very interested in this idea of codification and visual codification. And I've uh, carried that forward into my personal practice now, which talks a lot about personal histories, personal family archives, and I'm really interested in the idea of approaching my own history through codification. And there's a lot of things that I have encountered along the way that have really, uh, really proved been thought provoking in this process. And and one of them uh, that has been happening recently is um, the the question of when to teach people how to speak your visual language and your codified language, and when to step away from articulating and instead elevate the unsayable and invest it with its own language. Um, I have... uh, witnessed a very interesting phenomenon in my master's program that um, uh, seems to be very steeped in in, um, gender dynamics, um, which is the expectation, uh, particularly on uh, young women artists, uh, to uh, explain, overly explain, overly articulate. Um, So a lot of the female artists get the, uh, the feedback, I don't understand. I don't understand what you're trying to do. I don't understand what you're trying to say. Um, particularly from male teachers. And so I am really deep in this process of understanding this question of codification, of secrecy, of inventing a visual language that uh, that engages with the unsayable on its terms. And this question of sharing stories in a way that people can connect to them and um, and can can understand and engage with them. So I will open that up to the larger group and I'm very excited to hear other people's topics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. That was really amazing. Uh, I'd like to uh, pass it on to Bruce. I I, I, I don't know how my lip reading's doing, but I said that is a scary image. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure if that's what you were talking about, but here I is. That's great. That was really, really uh, fascinating. Um, uh, uh, I, I wish you luck because uh, you could potentially venture into territory, which sounds like you're already there, uh, that's uh, you know extremely horrifying and, and uh, you know will scare you at night and all that kinds of stuff. Um, I, I, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Well, I don't know. I mean, this this is uh, you know it's 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 funny. A couple years ago, before COVID. Um, um, for many decades, 25 years, literally, at the local library down the street, about a block or so from here. Actually, I can almost walk over there while I'm talking. Uh, I ran a thing called Cine Salon, where we showed movies and talked in a little environment and just, you know, uh, something every Monday night. Anyhow, the end of that series was, um, or near the end of that series, was a neighbor down the street the other direction. Well, I'm turning around and going that way. Um, was a lady named Sonia Landy Sheridan, who some of you may know, who was the founder of a thing called Generative Systems at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago um, in the 70s, 1970s. And one of her uh, fanboys, or fan base artists, was Aldo Tambellini. And in 19, there's a reason to this story, I'm not just gonna ramble totally. In 1977, Aldo came to do a residency there with the proviso that he could do a picture phone call. And at the time, AT&T was in, invented this thing called the picture phone, where it was for businesses, really. But somehow, Sonia, with her, her ties to technology and science and uh, the little hustler that she was, she worked it out that uh, the students, her students, graduate students, of which I was one of, I think, 15 of us, and Aldo and her, um, went to the AT&T building, and then another AT&T building, and the other half went, uh, you know, split in half, and we did a picture phone call with artists. And of course, none of us knew what to do. We were literally dropped in a room, given a half hour, then that was that. And we came up with all kinds of ridiculous things. Well, anyhow, blah, 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 so years later, being here in Hanover at the Cine Salon, I figured, why not do something with both Sonia and Aldo? And we redid it. Um, but this was a time 
when none of us, remember, uh, Aldo was what, 89 or 83 or 4, right before he died? Is that the, the age, Michael? I, I don't remember. He was 90. 90, yeah, okay. And 90. Sonia was the same, like 92 or 89. And uh, myself, I was completely untech savvy. We were all idiots. We had no idea <laughs> even how to, uh, you know, run um, uh, uh, FaceTime or, or anything. So eventually we had this evening that all these people helped us to do it. We, we rekindled the event, you know, a zillion years later, 19, whenever that was, 2020 or 2000, yeah, 2020. And, uh, Tons of practice. I mean, it was like Aldo was in a state of coming and going mentally. Not mentally. He was pretty there mentally, but physically he was very ill and in and out of the hospital kind of thing. And Sonia was off in her own little world too, but pretty much together. And um, um, I don't even know how to explain this. There was so much planning that went on before the event, you know, to organize it, that the program was even out of the gate, it was a three, four hour program just with all the events that were supposed to happen. And then the whole time, uh, uh, Sonia's wife, I guess, Anna Salome, uh, was managing the, you know, in between to keep Aldo going and Sonia and everybody was having the artist kind of things that go on between artists and all that stuff. And <laughs> how there was a script done, a really detailed script that was incredible. Uh, there was this prelude of movies and things to introduce the, you know, the who they were to the world, if you didn't know who they were. And then there was an audience of, I don't know, there was about 20, 25 people in the room, and there may be 60 around the world tuned into this, let alone all the surviving people from that class, i.e. the graduate students, you know, right? So anyhow, after all this blah, 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 we finally go in. But the thing was, because of Aldo being ill and Aldo being Aldo, he wouldn't really engage with me or anyone. He would email Sonia, but that was it. And then the night of the event came. And this is a stupid story. I don't even want to tell it to you. I guess because it relates to what we're doing right now. The whole world's doing with this stuff. Was um, <laughs> not that he refused to engage the night of the show, but he had, like, in his mind, made up what the program was going to be that was completely different than the program we'd all planned, <laughs> including the script. So he was always, for about an hour, he's going, well, when do I get to talk? When do I get to talk? It was really a complete disconnect. It was, it was hilarious in its own weird way. And eventually it all came together. But um, I don't know why I'm telling you this story, except I guess now it's all ubiquitous. And I'm not sure for your, your age, because there's a disparity of ages here. Um, you know, we're all doing it now. But that time before COVID, it was maybe six months before COVID, uh, whatever year that was. Maybe it was January, that same year of COVID. But it was amazing to go from something Sonia and Aldo had dreamt up in 1977 had become now the reality for everybody. So I'm done. I hope I didn't ramble too much. <laughs> I have a lot to say, but that's enough for the moment. Thank you. That's, no, that's amazing. And uh, also... Yeah, I have a lot also to add, well, to everybody's presentations, but from the perspective of, of being around Aldo Tambellini, uh, especially around that time, too. Um, so, I mean, it's, it is pretty amazing. Now, our guest from Chicago, Hi. just back from, from Overhausen. Yes. Lori Felker, I'm so excited to have you on this show, of course, and I uh, go ahead and take it away. Hi, so I'm, it's weird now that I'm only looking at myself. I know people can't see that, that I'm only looking at myself, but all of a sudden my audience, the humans I was just talking to and listening to disappeared. So, um, hi Lori, how are you? <laughs> uh, I, I just made a joke. I'm all about humor. Some of you might know this, if you know me and you're listening to this. I used to teach a class on humor and filmmaking at UW-Milwaukee um partially because i i love it i love i love to laugh i love work that awakens a sense of play uh forces like a response from the audience and i just i feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of wonderful serious topics in film and art and so many things that need to be dealt with and we do have a tendency to prioritize those in academia and in programming and so there's randos like me who bust open the door and say like, well, how about we watch things also that have important topics, but um, we can giggle and throw tomatoes at the screen at the same time. So that's my, like, I, I think about humor a lot and all the things it could mean. But the reason why this became my topic today 
is because I just, I screened a new film just this past week, twice on Monday in Milwaukee around a mostly local Milwaukee um, audience because it was in the Milwaukee show. So it was like people who are members of the Milwaukee film um, membership club kind of thing. People who just go see everything at the local Milwaukee film festival, people who are there to support their relatives and friends who made films who were in this program. And then I premiered it um, in Germany at the end of the week on Saturday um, in front of at the Oberhausen film festival, which is like, it was a packed room full of international critics and filmmakers and um, people translating, like maybe they're, they're maybe they're translating the English that they understand, but they're still kind of translating back into their own language in their heads. So there's different languages in the room. Um, lots of very serious, very um, abstract uh, pieces of work. And those filmmakers were in the room. And so this film of mine, I'm trying not to give too much away because you haven't seen it. And I also, it has, there's some spoiler alert situation going on, but to keep it short, it takes place in a medical center. Um, and so for the most part, you're seeing patients and um, doctors together. And I did not write a full script. I had an outline. Um, I gave the actors um, like sort of cases, case studies to know. And, you know, the two, the doctor and the patient in the room also didn't totally know the same things. I tried to make it as much like what a real situation might be. So the the patient would know a lot more. They would know their own history. They would have a backstory, but then they might come in and just say, I have a stomach ache, right? They say very little, but there's this whole world behind it. The doctor sees a few things on the sheet, um, you know, name, age, past medical past um, medicines that they might have been taking, et cetera. But then they come in and they just have to kind of like figure out what's going on. We've all been in doctor's appointments, so I think this is pretty familiar. So this is me trying to recreate that like natural awkwardness and like two people trying to kind of figure it out in the room. And so it's a 19 minute film and there's different scenarios and there's sort of another narrative woven in. Again, I'm not trying to give away too much if you ever get to see my movie. <laughs> But what I realized, so some of the actors actually like cried naturally in these moments because they had, um, they either put in a, a heavy backstory or um, they were even just so impressed with the situation that was going on between them and the doctor and, and whatever their ailment was, which may have been a little intense in some of the scenes, it actually just moved them to, to tears, like in a, an authentic, natural way. I did not ask them to cry. Um, and there's, there's talk in the film of, you know, loss and pain and psychosis, um, and confusion and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so it's a pretty heavy thing. Like even just me describing this, I'm sure it sounds fairly heavy. So I premiered it in Milwaukee on Monday and then into Germany on Saturday. And in both cases, there were all these wonderful moments of laughter and I say wonderful because I already told you that I really like laughter and humor. And as soon as I heard laughter in the room at a time when there was no joke and someone didn't slip on a banana peel <laughs> um, and it was not presented, I didn't set it up that way. I was so relieved. Um, and this feeling really overpowered me of feeling relieved about my film. And then also just feeling like I'm standing in the back of the theater because I tend to nervously pace in the back when I'm premiering something. Hitting the back of the theater, every, people laugh at a certain moment. And all of a sudden, it's like these doors open and the audience enters the room. You know, at, at first, it's like we're not even really there together, but they become human. I hear voices and I hear like different kinds of laughter and different kinds of laughter at different times. And so thinking about, you know, our guffaws and chuckles, snickers, groans, and even like the sound of like gritted teeth and what makes us do that in a film right and so obviously there can be jokes and like straight up comedy but it could even be um you know something like just what we might do in response to levity from the bleak right and that little bit of levity can simply be something really bleak is going on and another character interrupts by opening the door that's it that happens to us all the time we get interrupted but that interruption can be like a, a release and then the audience in that moment might need to physically react to it as, as we might through a sigh or something that's audible and something that might sound or seem close to a laugh. We might be surprised. Um, it may be our response to awkwardness. We may realize something. My film kind of unfolds itself. It's a bit of a puzzle. 
And so there were these different moments of people just going like, oh, ah, aha, you know, and it's not funny on screen, but there's this joy in understanding something that might cause the laugh of realization, which I really love to hear. Um, it sounds a little bit like I'm just saying my film's amazing and it makes people respond in a lot million different ways. I think it's just really that this particular film surprised me. Um, I set it up a certain way to play a certain sort of experimental narrative game and and then I was so overjoyed with these various responses. But sometimes, like I said, this laughter could be like a release of fr from frustration or suspension. Uh, many people laugh in horror films because we're don't touch the doorknob for so long, don't open the door for so long, that when the door busts open, we actually, if you if you listen to a lot of horror audience, we don't tend to scream, scream. It's almost too embarrassing. It's like too much. We're also smart enough and awake enough to know it's not happening to us. So more often than not, people actually laugh when the door is finally opened or when the monster pushes it. We're like, it's like the air is pushed out of us. Um, sometimes we're just exasperated. We're trying to get out of an awkward situation. Sometimes we disagree with something on screen. And we actually might even think that like, oh, this character is, excuse the use of my word crazy, but that would be the word that most people would use. You might think that choice is crazy or this idea is so, it's too much, I can't handle it. It's just so not what I would do. It's just so outside of me, it's so unpredictable. And so we almost laugh as like a scoff towards this thing that we're disagreeing with. Um, we may even be laughing directly at something in a, in a way we think it's ridiculous, but where we are really poking at it. So like if I see Tucker Carlson on screen at all, if I see his face, I laugh and I'm very mad at him and I do not like him. And it's a very serious political and social and global problem, that man. <laughs> but um, excuse me if you disagree with me, but I don't know why you'd be here if you did. Uh, but in that moment, I'm like, I can just, it, I can, I feel like I'm letting myself la laugh at him, which seems like a rude and unhelpful thing to do. Or is it actually sort of, forceful or bold or, or active or activist to find something horrendous on screen and, and laugh at it. Let it like, let your humor hit it like, like bullets, right? Um, a movie like, I, I don't know why I'm bringing up, this is the first thing that popped into my head, but I'm thinking of like Inglorious Bastards, right? Sorry to, I, I always feel like when I bring up Quentin Tarantino, I regret it, but <laughs> a movie that is, you know, dealing with um, horrendous characters um, and puts them in a light in which you can actually sort of throw daggers of laughter at them. But so one of the other things that's coming from this is that I, I would then hear the audience talking to each other or coming up to me afterwards and sometimes apologizing for the audience. Sometimes they would say, I don't know why people laughed at this part. I didn't think that part was funny. Or they would say like, yeah, I thought it was a bit too much. I really don't think, I really don't think it's that funny. Or I wouldn't have laughed out loud. It's not ha ha funny. I see the humor in it, Lori, or I see the levity, but um, it wasn't that funny or it's not that kind of funny or to laugh at this is inappropriate. And so after we have these natural responses to the film that I said is already not just simply joke equals comedy equals laugh. It's all these nuances of how we physically respond. And then I immediately just kept seeing the audience sort of judging each other. And some of it seemed almost to be like, well, I wasn't laughing. Am I doing it wrong? Am I, am I almost embarrassed? Or um, I was in one mindset, which is totally legitimate. And someone else was interrupting my mindset. I was sad. And their laughter was like changing my ear, changing like what I was keying into. And I just find it super fascinating to think about that and to think about how we judge each other. And it, and it might be one of the reasons why a lot of art film and experimental film is serious, because if we just avoid laughter and those sort of things, then we don't have to present our thoughts in front of the audience while we're in the audience, right? We can keep quiet, keep to ourselves, and then no one's gonna judge us. Um, even often when we cry during a movie, it's not that visible, you know, your eyes just well up and you stick the tissue in here and kind of, or you do the little like wipe and it's not that noticeable, but I feel like when we, we laugh and let ourselves respond, we put ourselves on trial a little bit and it might be safer not to do that. And then I just wanted to read one other thing. Um, so I took some acting classes a few years ago when I was pregnant, which was very funny, um, because I did have to, I had to act 
there was one scene I had to do where the character screams, I'm impregnable. And I was about seven months pregnant. It was very funny. Um, and just, just the way it was. But um, I took some acting classes at a place called the Acting Studio Chicago, where they use this book by Michael Shirtliff called, uh, called Audition. And it's like a book that teaches actors how to audition, what you can do if you get just like half a page of text, how you can like break that down, find something, make it your own. And he really goes in depth. So you could take, you know, usually sides for an actor, like a page and a half, two pages, something like that. And you're, and there's not, you know, it's hard to find a lot in there and you might not know the whole story, but this gives you like a million ways to find moments of discovery to think about what was the character doing right before the scene? What, what does the character do next? Like who in this scene is the character in love with? They're definitely in love with someone to find love and figure out why they're in love and why they're staying there. There's all these little notes that are really wonderful. And I, I love to use this in my classes, no matter how clearly we're teaching casting and rehearsing, or if we're, if I'm teaching experimental film, I have totally printed these <laughs> guideposts out. Um, because it, when I was learning them as an actor, it really affected me just as a filmmaker and a director, like how, just how to engage with and make material more interesting. I just want to read a little bit to you about his guidepost number four for humor. Um, and that'll be the last thing I do, but I just, I feel like I, I, just, I just like this a lot and it's not, I've read, you know, some philosophy and some writers and stuff write about humor and what it is. And I always find that okay, but I, I like how this works because it's for such a specific use to learn how to audition. Um, but it's so, so broadly about us as humans. Um, so it just says, humor is not jokes. It is that attitude toward being alive without which you would long ago have jumped off the 59th street bridge. Humor is not being funny. It is the coin of exchange between human beings that makes it possible for us to get through the day. Humor exists even in the humorless. There is humor in every scene, just as there is in every situation in life. There is humor in Chekhov, too seldom found, and even in Eugene O'Neill, virtually never found. When we say about a life situation, and it's not funny either, we are attempting to inject humor into a situation that lacks it. Because we just brought it up, right? <laughs> we try in life to put humor everywhere, and if we didn't, we couldn't bear to live. One would sometimes think actors are trying to reverse the life process by what they do on stage. They take humor out instead of put it in. That's what makes acting unlifelike. I have trouble believing in the seriousness of a scene in which there is no humor. It is unlike life. And yet actors will say to me, how can I find humor in this scene? It is very serious. For the exact same reason one would be driven to find humor in the same situation in life, because it is deadly serious and human beings cannot bear all that heavy weight they alleviate the burden by humor. Sometimes we lighten the burden for others because of the weight we are dumping on them, which we know is more than they can possibly want. Sometimes we lighten the burden for ourselves. Either way, the heavier the situation, the more we are needful of humor to endure it. So I like that too, because it kind of ties into like, you know, it makes me think about the audience, thinking about like what we might do for someone else with humor. And so, is there, is there a place where those people who can open up and make a sound in an audience are actually just opening up doors for the filmmaker, like I felt on Monday, last Monday, um, but also saying to the person sitting next to them, go ahead, you can feel something. And, and I'm telling you that because you heard me react. And it's, you know, is it possible that they're sending out signals to create a safe space? Um, I think humor, frequently or laughing can frequently be seen as like, that's bad. That's like, you're telling everyone else in the room how to feel and you're limiting the film. But I'm trying to look at it more in this like creation of a safe open space where everyone's allowed to respond. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that made sense. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, they, it, it was a, a lovely presentation for, from everybody. Um, I've been over here taking my my notes so i'm going to process really quickly and <laughs> respond because especially as we we it's interesting we, we're coming from the unsayable to the humor and um of course a lot of what is humorous i guess is also unsayable um and in in the sense that too that we um we, we covered it all certain we yeah right and we keep certain um, 
we keep certain um, amounts of our humor discreet. Um, just as uh, we were discussing the, the sort of like the discreet way in which um, working with actors uh, plays out, uh, especially as they have different backstories and may not know uh, the backstories, just as just as human beings come with that own dis that discrete space that that the stranger um, uh, that that we approach, for instance, becomes more of an, an object as much as a, an archive. Uh, although that's really what each of us are to one another until uh, we begin to sort of dig deeper into to try and figure out who who we are um, to one another at the very least. Um, so I, I think I, I'll start there. Is it? It's a, it's an interesting thing too, especially as we're we were talking about to to begin with, like uh, pronouns as well, um, and 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 what that means to a certain uh, codification. Um, I think that like my own, um, for instance, I use he, him, they, them pronouns, um, and it's uh, uh, having to do in, in in at least in in part with my own uh, struggles with whatever the context of masculinity is. Uh, what it is to be a man, um, and my own uh, growing up in in um, in relation to that. My uh, I would say also like as it pertains to humor, as it pertains to being laughed at, the bullets, for instance, of being laughed at. I think that that all actually um, is something that I've been working on my own for my own self uh, as a sort of transformative process to to take elements of humor um, and to instead uh, re reflect them back in, in ways that I can create um, art experiences um, or this, this um, uh, what I've referred to as events that bring different consciousness together in order to uh, react with one another for the formation of an, another compartment of consciousness. And I, I think that that, that, um, that form of humor we're dealing with, especially from the context of American uh, humor or American high schools uh, uh, or American public schools, is very interesting because we're so used to humor, uh, at least in my own experience, humor being used as, as a taunt, a, a bully, uh, or as a as a means of hurting, um, and and that really I think developed in in my own upbringing um, when I was in first or second grade, and I began to understand that the things that I loved or that that I had attachments to were now not impervious to being critiqued or cre criticized with uh, sometimes a, a, a something used as humor, but is really really actually weaponized. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll kind of like come full circle on, on that uh, in terms of, of humor and how, how humor works into, um, uh, in, into all of that. Um, I, I'm actually brought uh, kind of close to something that everyone else said when I think about um, John Luc Godard's uh, Goodbye to Language. Um, and, and, and Goodbye to Language, there's just these, uh, if I remember correctly, there are these intermittent scenes of people shitting. And it's just that they're talking and they're shitting and they're like stuck in like this domestic situation, holding serious conversations and speaking of highfalutin uh, philosophy and then brought back into the bathroom to just shit again. And, it, and if that's not part of like that discreet humor that we as body owners all have as a sort of like this this waste product that we develop um and and also how it relates to what laurie's speaking about um uh in in the analysis of of humor actually being that which keeps us like somehow on this uh absurd and very very painful uh, world in which we're constantly dealing with loss uh on the speaking of dealing with loss Aldo Tambellini, I've talked about several times in this podcast, and Tambellini was my mentor um, in a way that I had not experienced anybody uh, willing to 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 help and, and mentor bef me before. Um, uh, he, uh, uh, and this is not to in any way to dismiss those who have. Um, it's just that Aldo was like my family and was like my grandfather, and so when he passed. I um, 
I felt an, an, an insane amount of, of trauma that, that uh, I'd almost describe as being like a laugh at first, but what really was is like a vomit of crying, like that immediately uh, hit me. The irony of it is that I found out about Aldo's death through an iPhone uh, and through a uh, Instagram post at that. Um, and it's the, the humor, the irony of that is not lost on me, given Aldo's uh, participation at MIT with Harvard uh, on creating uh, work that was like uh, broadcast technology, shortwave broadcast technology, and this iPhone project um, from the late 70s uh, that, that Bruce is a part of. I, I think that, that, um, that there is a, 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 a deeply funny aspect of Aldo Tambolini, who actually will probably come across as being that very abstract overhousing, you know, showcased work. Um, and yet there is uh, one of his famous pieces, I think I've talked about just a little bit on this uh, uh, broadcast, is something called The Screw. And Aldo literally delivered a screw to the Whitney Museum into the Museum of Modern Art because they asked him to like deliver, like to, to give him a sculpture. And so he gave him a big screw and then he had um, uh, some students or some, some, um, some young people who were uh, around his neighborhood um, and he, they wanted to learn how to be barbershop quartet, how to, how, to, how to sing. So he came up with a whole song in which it's basically like, the museums, the galleries, they're, they're taking our art, they're, they're making it into uh, capitalists, you know, nothing, whatever. And so here's the screw, basically. Um, and while each museum took the screw, they did not really uh, take kindly to what Aldo was doing with the, with the gesture. Um, but he, when he struck with humor, it was always a strike at these larger structures, these these other aspects of of uh, the institution, and um, and I'm not surprised also that that Aldo, Aldo and I kind of take after one another in that um, when Aldo had the position to speak, he would use it almost always to talk about the things that mattered most to him, and so usually that had to do with um, civil rights, uh, and that had to do with blackness as a cosmic concept. Um, I think that the uh, aspect of, of all of this kind of coming back and forth is in this idea of the healing process through new modes of language. And that's what that's a, that's a, a phrase that uh, Zoe, I think I'm paraphrasing from you. Um, there are ways in which I think my own uh, reaction against my own childhood and, and even humor um, and maybe this is a case with a lot of people in experimental film. It drove me into creating some work that was like of a really deep, sorted, <laughs> morbid, uh, 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 almost like uh, uh, the purest black uh, that I could uh, achieve in terms of uh, a lacking of humor, a lacking of, uh, of, of anything that one could find other than the, the, the most disturbed or... or um, uh, say, a saturation of all of this pain and suffering, only to recognize very quickly, I think, um, that it, it's, not, it's, not so, uh, it's, not, it's not so easy to communicate with, with someone else when you're offering nothing. Um, and so finding these ways of offering uh, uh, something to, an, to another can involve this exchange of the humor. Uh, I don't think there's ever a podcast that we ever have where there's not jokes, at the very least, uh, intermixed within this discourse of uh, consciousness and art on a very high level, uh, twisted together. So that 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 to me speaks to the way in which our dynamics, especially when sharing information that's deeply passionate to us, these passions arise with the laugh, with the smile, sometimes with um hesitation with confusion and there's a reaction against that at times um but i find that the whole symphony of of uh human reactions is uh, a, a means by which we are 
capable of using cinema to be more than a linguistic tool, to be more than a visual tool, but essentially to communicate something akin to a deep, deep, undisclosed metaphysical space. Um, and somehow that, that, that transfers. Um, I, 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 I still, you know, obviously there, there's so much in what everyone said um, that I could go on in other uh, tangents, yet um, I, I'm very interested in still in this discussion of, of codification um, and how maybe there's, there's a way that uh, a conversation there where um, we're using the iPhone, this technology to break that, right? And yet it is through codified means. We even use codified means to create a movie, like the set itself or um, the ways in which we're assembling uh, the languages that we had already developed that we choose to potentially recycle. And then how humor breaks apart a lot of these pre-constructed or preconceived notions. Uh, and and, and Lori, to, 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 to wrap it up, Lori speaks of the um, unintended uh, humor or the unintended emotional reaction within um, the, uh, I would almost say that, that directing, uh, right, it can be a performance in and of itself, like a performative art piece. And yet, you know, there's uh, a way in which you're curating these things up within practitioners of the body and of the performative um, to then play out as elements within a space that it's interesting to see what happens when we do um, uh, affect uh, and control particular elements of the emotional spectrum and watch as they, uh, as they play out and interact within other consciousness. Sort of what I do here is speak out, regurgitating what I feel from this in the hopes that you also have something that um, pertains to your practice to continue the conversation going. So um, uh, I will uh, open up the floor. Pressing the wrong button. <laughs> so sitting here all the time, pressing the little red thing on the screen. And I know it's, it's always, I mean, like it's, for anybody who, who's listening in, there is a microphone on our screen yeah. And we literally have to press it and unpress it. But sometimes... Talk about humor. <laughs> <laughs> fumbling. Fumbling is the best. It's so so true and so real. So yeah. I have a, I don't know if this relates or not, but it's it's kind of... Uh, it might go back to Zoe and, and her ineffable. Ineffable? Is that the wrong word? Am I using the wrong word? Um, unsayable was mine, but I love I love where you're going with it. <laughs> okay, well, this is this is weird, and, and what I what I kind of do all the time is I work on films, and usually old films, okay, and like I've restored Ballet Mechanique, the Leger film. I don't know how many times, like hundred, <laughs> at least four or five times. And blah blah blah. I got two things to tell. I wasn't even talking about Ballet Mechanique, but I will really quickly. Your first thing you said about what got you going with your stuff was uh, when I was in Nice and Biot, it was for the Leger retrospective that I was somehow tied up with for years on end. But one man whose name I forget, who lives and teaches in Houston, I believe, he's a well-known scholar, he had the most incredible talk about, and I guess what his studies are on the film, is that the film La Le Mechanique is Leger's response to the trauma of World War I. Mm -hmm. So it had nothing to do with aesthetics. It had to do with seeing all that mass killing using machines. And it was like, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> you got it, you know. But that's not the, what I wanted to touch on. What I wanted to touch on is a more interesting, more recent event that went on. Um, so I collect films. I, you know, I have things. And I'm not sure how this all came to be. Oh, I know how it came to be. Is for some reason or other, I got interested in chasing around or following online the, the scholar Andre Habib. I think it's how you say his name, who's into found footage. And amazing, stuff. amazing, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, and that led to a, a thing, an online thing at the Cinematheque Francaise from 2018 where he's given one of his talks. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing a film that I've owned my almost a whole life since 1977. <laughs> Had no idea where it came from. I mean, I know how I got it because I copied it from the Art Institute Film Library. I hope you don't work at the Art Institute, Lori. <laughs> uh, I used to. <laughs> well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Everyone's copying everything. I don't care. 
in the 70s. And I always show it because it literally is inequitable. And what it is, is it's the epileptic seizure comparison films, where it's just this horrendous thing that has a very interesting little history. And it's okay, you know this stuff, okay? Wait, so, I think, I think Patrick, Fre did Patrick Friel just show these in Chicago? He, yes, of course, because yeah. his, his show was ineffable. Yeah. <laughs> shout, out, shout out to Patrick Friel. <laughs> yeah, Patrick's, Patrick's ineffable. Right, right. Sorry, I can't even the word. But anyway, the point of all this is, here it is that why Andre was showing at the Zen of Tech is, this is a film that Hollis Frampton made that he called uh, Public Domain. And all he did was take the Library of Congress film and put his thing on the end of it. And then there's a whole weird story of how it came to be. But the question is, and Andre right away was on this too, I've had this film sitting in my closet for what, 40, 50 years, loving it. Had, I know it came from the paper prints and all that, but why was it in Chicago? So of course, Andre being Andre dives into this like massive attack. I mean, it was crazy watching. It was like watching one of those Chuck Jones cartoons, you know, of everything going 100 miles an hour, of reaching out to every scholar he knew, and blah, blah, getting everybody all going. And it ends up, there's an incredible history behind why that film is at the Art Institute of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to the fact that somehow or other when Brackage, Stan Brackage and Hollis Frampton were friends, Frampton went to the Library of Congress and watched a ton of films, ordered a hundred of them, and eventually for a talk at the Whitney Museum in 1978 uh, that was on uh, found footage, whatever that means, he put together these films and showed it, and all the people there that, that were there and reported back on the show, you know, which are very few at this point, said, it was terrible, it made no sense. What was he trying to do? Because he didn't say a word. Hollis, Hollis Frampton didn't say a word, which is amazing. It ends up, the reasoning for the film pick was A, B, C in the title. <laughs> The Library of Congress. That was the ordering principle, A, B, C, D. You know. yeah. And then he talked Stan Brackage into looking at these films, and Brackage then bought the exact same set of films to give a lecture to artists where he talked in Brackage and blah, 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 blah. And then somewhere along the line, a year or two later, I was there at graduate school, and we copied them in the middle of the night down in the basement with the optical printer. And I've been showing it forever, driving people out of audiences. Although I've had lots of audiences where at the end of the show, a doctor will come on and go, we studied those films in medical school. It was like, <laughs> so I hope I'm hitting on both topics of just the craziness of how life can go with, and then I'll, about films of people naked on the ground shaking, which that's a whole story in and of itself. And then this crazy story that happened by a serendipitous encounter with Andre on tape or online. But it also, it, I think you're talking about, oh, I'm loud and somebody. Computer. computer. Sorry, FDL, I can't oh, yeah. hear that well. <laughs> well I can hear oh, yeah. feedback coming through. Feedback, feedback. Just but I can't hear it well because of the Red Funk Railroad. Oh. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that um, I don't know if someone if someone else should mute to make sure it's not. Yeah, let's all mute our mics. If you you really got to mute our mics. Okay, just for just for now. I don't know. I don't know why I'm the one make causing feedback. Um, but what you were just saying made me think about the, like, you know, their images and those images are fixed, right? Those were the things that were recorded at that time and they were saved. They're they fixed, but the guys that laying on the ground having the epileptic seizures are shaking out of the frame. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not fixed within the frame, but yeah. But there, but then there's all these, even within that one, those things that were recorded that there was an initial intention, but then there are all these other intentions for the different displays and the different things and thereby like really pulling it further away from clarifying language, right? Or adding, going back to all of Zoe's wonderful thoughts, like it's adding a whole other vocabulary, a whole other language. Cause now it's like the, la if Hollis Frampton's dealing with it, it's the language of experimental film, the language of image permanency, which like it was not what, that's not what it originally was. But the truth now is that all of those truths are baked in to the image. And so, and it just makes me think about like my my situation too, where I felt like it was, I maybe there's uh, trying to get to something where it's like as a creator, um, as one of these like grad students who is making a film and and they have an image in there and they don't have full intention 
but they have a connection to the image and they know it needs to be there. And perhaps it's even specifically designed in order to get multiple readings, right? So like me working with these actors who are improvising and being really natural in this medical space, I wasn't like, I want to make the audience cry. I want to make the audience laugh. I want to make the audience duh. I was like, I don't know what they're going to say. <laughs> I don't know exactly how it's going to come out. And then I'm going to control it with editing. But I still, I still felt like I wanted it to be open. And so this idea of like, it's unsayable, but it's also non-specified. It's non-dictated emotional response, non-dictated intellectual response or linguistic response. And so instead, the best thing you can hear as that maker is that there are 90 different readings. Not that I think the in the critique situation, because I've experienced this as a professor, too, where the where you're just you 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 can't say what you're seeing and what you're feeling and you don't know why it's there. And so you're in the moment, which in the critique situation is very stressful and irritating in the moment. You have to say something right? This runs out in 45 minutes. And so you're like, well, I don't know what it is. I don't know what to say. So it's not working. And we back ourselves into these critique corners. And then it's so liberating when you're done with school and the critique is over and you realize you can actually sit with something you don't know, you don't like, and you can't say or whatever. <laughs> I mean, like doesn't even have to be a part of it, but Zoe, I don't know if you... So I'm, I'm on the road right now doing these programs on Joseph Cornell, and in particular, Rose Hobart. I assume you're all familiar with that film. Yes? No? Okay. And so, <laughs> just the other day, literally the other day, at the uh, Eastman House, it's this program, our program of films, it ends with Rose Hobart. And I gave a little bit of introduction at the beginning of, of the program in general, just because of time issues. And so afterwards, I'm feeling all fine and happy about myself, right? And I go up before the next set of films, or another hour, going to be after this. And an audience member puts up their hand and goes, I had no idea what that film was about. Can you explain it? <laughs> Rose Hobart. I was gobsmacked. I just stood there like, what? <laughs> I don't know what it's about. Why are you asking me? <laughs> I'm an expert on the films, not the content. You know what I mean? I, I really was just sitting there like, uh, bah, 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 bah. so I know what you're talking about. Um, and that's pretty embarrassing when you know you have an audience that's actually sitting there watching this stuff and not leaving. <laughs> you know, it's, like... <laughs> it's beautiful. I feel like um, a lot of film festivals that I've gone to specifically for experimental films have had one audience member who's been dragged along and who is maybe it's their first time. And they always ask my favorite question. And sometimes they ask it kind of angrily, which is, why? Why would you choose to make something so weird with a format that we know can be so familiar and so workable and so and so shared and and I think it's such an interesting uh, such an interesting question and and it's some one that is actually like a legitimate question is why why do that and and. I was really appreciating everything that you were saying, Lori, about this idea of, well, I have like different notes that I've, I've written here. Um, and, and this question of, you said non-dictated emotional and linguistic response, which um, I, I wrote down while you were speaking uh, this note about the different mindsets within the audience of your film and how you were watching people engaging with the film in completely different ways and even pinning their engagements against each other. And, um, and I think there's something really um, present there, there, there's something about the unsayable that feels very present in that I've, I've started thinking about the unsayable as like a subterranean communication, the way that I've, I've, uh, been talking about it recently is like we're speaking stomach to stomach it's not brain to brain it's stomach to stomach and i think that's something so unique about film and you know whatever way it's shared but especially in these shared spaces where we're watching it in a room together whether it's installed or in a theater is you're witnessing that subterranean language engage with different people in different ways all at the same time. And I think that there's this kind of overarching question of, are we okay with having different truths 
coexisting. I mean, something that's so fantastic about bringing up this film about um, epilepsy, which is bananas to watch and experience. Um, it reminds me of the the archival research that I was doing for this film in 2018 when I first met M. Woods, which is so crazy, is I was going into these archives with these very official, like big French ledgers with, you know, uh, the beautiful text and these, and these photos, they had photos. And it was very goofy. It was like very serious. It was very medical but it was, it was goofy. It was about hysteria. It was about these things that we have deemed with the passage of time to be, you know, outdated and misguided and, and, and just different. But, but seeing that it was truth at that time was very, very revealing. This idea of the medical language, when you realize that that's a construct, the way that we approach even the most indisputable facts is a construct it opens up so much potential for this question of truth and sharing truth wow okay so this actually gives me a, a like a segue segue okay so that is also the nature of the institution of oxford and probably most other right and laurie and i have have both spent time at oxford and the way in which Oxford works is essentially a, uh, a labyrinthine structure. So each college kind of has its own kind of governing structure around the library, et cetera. But whenever there's a problem, of course, it's somebody else's problem. So they, they, they managed to uh, get the archive itself is built on a lot of apocryphal texts. And I, I was thinking about that as like the, the archive of human uh, of history, right? And in, in the case of Oxford, it's the quote, English speaking or the, the uh, I mean, you know, they have a, a, a historical text, of course, from all around the world. Um, it's, it's largely the, the Latin text, the old English text, etc. cetera, um, then leading into the, the text from the last 300 or 400 years. And one thing that came to mind when you, when you spoke about that was, um, uh, you know, I, I did I did a lot of work looking at the Royal African Company notes and the mm. the charter of the Royal African Company, uh, the charter of the East India Company, etc. Um, these texts that are like themselves absurd, bananas, completely like um, a falsehood placed upon a reality to generate a reality, um, and and so there's there's something about that, and not to tie like it, it, such something so like. Uh, uh, um, heavy as, as for instance, what's contained in those archives, which is just like pure atrocity. Um, there's also the the um, the thing, and so, something that I've mentioned before too, um, is the pseudo Isidorus te texts, the texts that were created uh, by essentially the Catholic Church to try and prove that Constantine had given the entire empire to St. Sylvester and therefore that the kingdoms of, of Europe, et cetera, were actually the, the property of the Catholic uh, church. Um, and, and all of those things I think holds together their own kind of like uh, set of perspectives. You always feel as though you're actually entering into a sort of historical uh, perspective as if the phantasm and the psychogeography of the place itself is guiding you through. Um, and sometimes I think that that's what actually happens in movies too, is it gloms onto the structures that are also captured um, so that there is like a, 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 a level in which that perspective that you're talking about, um, this multi-dimensional perspective works very much like I think the situationists were discussing psychogeography and that, that, that uh, the film is like a, a stamp, a mark, uh, from, from that psycho uh, psychoanalytical um, uh, example that Freud gives, for instance, not to speak of Freud, but still it's an interesting example of the stamp of the hot wax and that the psyche is uh, the results of all of the, the things, all the traumas as you were discussing before, but all the events uh, that, that, are, that hold on, that it holds on to and it's the shape and the contours of it. Um, I find that, that that that's definitely the case there. And now to like completely, oh, sorry, I just bumped my mic. Now to completely go off on another tangent though, I made a movie about Roger Stone. Actually, I didn't make the movie. So Roger Stone made a movie and he used to make this series of stuff called The Stone Zone, okay? And The Stone Zone is like this YouTube Roger Stone 
2015, 2014, he didn't have anything going on for him. He's trying to get he's trying to get some YouTube cash. He's trying to be like a conservative pop culture critic. And so among these things, right, Roger Stone says Pharrell Williams is often his favorite at best dressed. Okay. Pharrell Williams is is his um, sartorial choice normally, but Pharrell went to the Grammys wearing shorts. And that's a big no-no for Roger Stone. So what I did was I took this Roger Stone, like 10 minute, whatever, diatribe, downloaded it, converted it to ProRes because I had to make it like nice, right? And then, <laughs> and then I, uh, I made it my movie. It's called Perfect Bullshit. But I also remember Perfect Film, which you and I actually saw together at Collective Shown Cinema, uh, mm-hmm. Zoe, and we were bawling, like crying our eyes out. And so for those who don't know, Perfect Film is a work that uh, essentially um, uh, Ken Jacobs puts his uh, signature on, uh, but was found. um, And it contains some of the newsreels surrounding uh, the events following the assassination of Malcolm X. Um, And it is probably one of the most painful experiences I've ever had uh, watching movies. And they're literally just newsreels, so it's not necessarily because of anybody's um, intent, this why we're asking. Um, and yet there is this, there's this deep, deep embedded pain in knowing that the events that were to occur, we knew from every angle and the playing back of these events in a sort of out of order, uh, 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 just raw press reels um, brought it even sharper every single time we had to pass through what was this damned uh, sequence of time space. Um, now, how, how that reacts within a theater, um, how anything reacts within a theater, um, calls upon like an inner world that we never have um, quite a lot of, um, say, visual on we, we we can't we can't embody it and yet we know it's going on and so that's where this sort of unsayable and in the ineffable co- both pop up um yeah. there's a great story i always like to tell about um I, the poet robert creeley i was working at pittsburgh filmmakers as a programmer and invited him to, to come which i to me was like oh good this is great you know Robert Keeley, Robert Creeley, you know, right? I but went to Pittsburgh Filmmakers. Yeah, yeah, it was open-ended, right? And the deal was, you know, you pick it. So what he picked was the act of seeing with one's own eyes, which was made in Pittsburgh at the Pittsburgh Morgue, right? So, you know, it was kind of going to be a heavy evening, right? So he comes and he starts talking about uh, uh, the poet Browning, and he's giving this wonderful talk, and the place, place was packed. I mean, it's a little place, like 100, 150 people packed. And, you know, most people knew what they were coming to get, right? And even the coroner was there. The Cecil Weck or whatever his name was, he came out. It was like 1980 or so, so it's way after the film was made. And, uh, but somebody's making noise in the back row, you know, as this thing's progressing. And he's talking about English, you know, browning and all this stuff. And all of a sudden he stops and he goes, my good man, I've been invited by these people to come here. And they've brought me here and they paid me well and they're taking care of me. But I was, I was engaged to come and speak about this film. May I help you to deal with the situation? And the guy goes, <laughs> he goes, well, hurry up. I got a party to go to. <laughs> he came He's to see pre-game, the autopsy. Pre-game. <laughs> Not Greeley, the autopsy. What do you do with oh, that? So great. So great. <laughs> right. <laughs> but all of this is like making me think about all of the judgment we put on each like, other. We're talking about the critique a little bit and then talking about like me hearing people apologizing for other people laughing and then even these things like this strange and it's like why why would you bother to judge like the individual artist or like the situation that's going on in this particular way and it's just something like the person who's doing that judging must be so vulnerable because right they just sat there and had to draw from themselves in order to read these images and do whatever. And if they're not being let in, if they can't figure it out, then they're losing. 
So they're going to be defensive. <laughs> and if they, if they get in and they don't like what they see, or if they think that someone else might have a better reading than them, it's just really weird. We just, I mean, I think I can do that. I, I'm admitting to probably doing this too, right? And I'm sure I do it when I'm watching things alone, right? Where I start, so it's like, everybody likes this film. I'm finally going to watch it. I'm watching it at home on Criterion or whatever. And I'm like judging it to start. Like, well, I don't know why everybody likes it. It seems okay, you know? And then sometimes like halfway through the movie, you're like, oh no, this is really good. Okay, they're right. Like I'm so, so but I'm like, what am I doing for the first half? Like it shows like the sort of social resonance of these images in every possible way, not simply like, oh, like that Malcolm X film, um, the Ken Jacobs film is like very, the social resonance is very clear. And there's this sort of shared thing, just watching that newsreel footage. But this is like the social resonance of being aware of being in a society, just because you're watching images, and that you could be judged or doing something wrong, or that there just that there's this inherent jump to comparison, and which would be why we might, um, you know, expect something out of someone's film that might not be there or to like demand. But you're, you're, that there is a reason, even though the artist is saying, well, it's, un, it's unsayable. Your like, story about the, the European showing was great because I, I, I can do you one better in the sense of, <laughs> no, you're, you're dealing with a different audience from a different set of countries that are bringing yeah. different things to it. And so more in, language translation too. Yeah, yeah in the 90s, uh, uh, when, when I was at Harvard, one of the greatest things, you know, Cambridge was, I had no idea what Cambridge was before I went there. It was like, somebody told me it's the Athens, the United States, and I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is, right? But anyhow, so the palliative to that was, uh, we, yeah, because of being at the Harvard Film Archive, I was had access to trade screenings, which is how movies used to be distributed that have these public screenings by law, and all these theater exhibitors would go. Then they also had press screenings for the press. And this all happened two, three weeks before film came out, right? But the best advanced screenings were the ones downtown Boston in the combat zone at the black theaters or the black audience theaters because they're laughing and talking and relating with the film in ways that had nothing to do with the white audience. And it was so educational to see a thousand people going at it, you know, in the ways that you're talking about, but all in this wave, the same wavelength because they knew they had the language issues going on or they had this, the same you know, they're coming from the same background, so to speak. It was great. It was absolutely great, especially humor, because humor played a very important part in no matter what some idiot did on the screen. <laughs> there was, and people talking back to the screen. That's another thing that's, that you, know, you would never usually see in anywhere but there in that situation. Yeah, my, I think great. that's the, my, my, my own, um, uh, say, experience with whiteness, especially within, like, art gallery settings and within, mm -hmm. like, film screenings related to art gallery settings and uh or or even like the prim and proper well, i used to call it the cheese and crackers sort of society uh, i've been in was the this, for decades i have no idea why people wear black look i mean it's just <laughs> <laughs> i don't get it no, 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 I, I feel like because you're not pure black okay <laughs> but zoe i don't know <laughs> i know i I'm still, I am, um, I have zhuzhed it up with my snail necklace. So that's okay. my defense. That's my defense. <laughs> and it's <laughs> really stupid American. Right. It's also because you're Thank French. You. So, you know. You, know. Yeah. <laughs> they, you get off the airplane and they hand you your uniform. That's right. It's the one yeah, mode of assimilation right. that I will take on. <laughs> they tried to make me English, but then they took away the visa. So... <laughs> Um, the, it's a great the thing conversation. Is, yeah. like, since we're all coming at films in a totally different way, but the, the, the funnel is when you show it. You know, I mean, yeah. no matter how and where, all these things are going on that you're talking about, that uh, you have been talking about, this is kind of amazing. But the, I like the stomach to stomach thing. Like, can you feed yourself this way? Can you elaborate? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great concept. I mean, well, it's it's funny. I was I was just thinking about to kind of lead into the that thought. Um, maybe one of the first experimental video screenings I went to was for a, a class for my school, and there was 
there was this moment where the teacher started playing the film and it was on 16 millimeter, which was very exciting. It was the first time I was seeing 16 millimeter and it was some avant-garde film with a very high performance art aspect of, of, of the, the sort of like whatever we could call the narrative arc. Anyway, something happened and, and somebody laughed and it was one of the moments where it was kind of surprising to me that this person laughed. And I was probably 18, 19 and falling in love with this thing that was happening in front of me. And I had this knee jerk reaction where I was like, you can't laugh at this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is very beautiful and very serious. And it was very interesting because the teacher led by example in a really lovely way by chuckling at the person laughing and then saying, that's amazing. What was funny in that moment? What was it that made you laugh? And there was something that clicked for me realizing that loving this thing, video art or art in general, requires a deeper humility than just taking it seriously. That it's like a, it's a love that we would want to give to each other one that's not just about like being in the sort of comfort zone of the the easy but but trying to push push deeper which is like getting that early and trying to go forward with that is such a blessing and is something that continues to feed itself mm -hmm. for the stomach to stomach thing i mean it's funny it's kind of a new like it's something that i've been writing a lot i've been doing a lot I'm, I'm finishing my master's right now. I've been doing a lot of applications and I haven't done this many applications since I applied for the master's a couple of years ago. So I'm revisiting this process of writing about my practice over and over and over again in this way of, hi, dear program, my name is Zoe. I do this practice. This is who I am. This is the project I want to do. And then doing that over and over again, um, there's the sort of like repetition of the, the phrases or the words that continue to come up. And the stomach to stomach one is one of the things that continues to come up, both in the context of the critiques, particularly in the context of those moments where um, someone may say like, but I don't understand this. And I wanna just like hold them and be like, this is how I'm talking to you. This is how we're speaking. This is, this is, the, this is the mode of our speaking. And there's something about the embodied nature, the physical nature. I have a, a background in um, psychoanalytic study and I've always had a particular interest in somaticized stress and somaticized feeling and intergenerational somaticized stories. And so I think there's something about the stomach to stomach thing that also has to do with the like, we're reaching into the soft spot when we're speaking, even in a funny humorous way or a serious way or the in-between of those two, we're, we're speaking to and from that soft spot. And, and I think that speaks a little bit to what Lori was saying earlier about how when people are feeling defensive, it's because that's been touched, that soft spot has been touched. And so there's there's just something about the, the physicality of saying like we're speaking between our stomachs right now that kind of like locks into that for me when I'm I'm trying to to articulate what it is um, that the sort of codification that I'm doing is that it's it's um, not as easily dismissible as maybe say a male teacher saying okay but I just can't understand it therefore it's not on purpose therefore what are you doing and to sort of like rearticulate it is on purpose this is very researched this is very intentional and this is why and this is what I'm, I'm hoping to connect with you about. I like you said this. something in, in all that, you said something that just threw me totally. You said a male professor. Have you really had that reaction? I mean, I shouldn't say put that much. I'm, I'm saying this facetiously. <laughs> I don't mean it that way. No, no. I mean, I, oh, thank you for laughing. <laughs> I mean, did you really have to explain yourself to someone like that? Oh, yeah. Oh okay, yeah, there, that's better. That's better said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
It's getting That's a little incredible. better all the time, but it's, it's getting a little better. Yeah. It's something that I did not experience at my school in the U.S., I will say. Um, well, not to, not college, to throw Europe under the under the car, but okay. I think, you know, pedagogically. No, Hampshire. You said Hampshire. And I said that was weird yeah. for Hampshire. Yeah. yeah, no, at Hampshire, it was like, let your free play fly, like, do I was going to say, they're a little bit ahead of the curve. Like, something. I yeah. It. yeah, but it's something that I, I notice. I mean, I'm, I um, work a lot with domestic materials. I work a lot with textiles and family, you know, like the napkin from the bu box under the bed that they finally sold at the garage sale. I do a lot with that. And um, I, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that um, that gets so much more of a response from, say, a male jury saying, I don't understand this, than maybe somebody putting a big blob of metal in the middle of a room would. And, the, you know, there's something there that I think is also linked to this. And I, I it, it's infuriating in its way, of course, but I'm, I'm also softening a little bit, realizing that there's... I, I, I think there's some of that defensiveness at play. I think there's some of that soft spot stuff at play. So I'll fight to protect the work. And also I'm recognizing that I think there's there's definitely some like inner stuff being sort of revealed. I don't know, I'm curious. I'm curious to hear what you guys think. The thing, the thing that I really love about the stomach idea too, just thinking about it, it's like the stomach, I mean, just to push the metaphor, the brain is like, the whole point of it when we say it's working correctly is, is the logic making machine. It, it, it's doing things intentionally in a certain order. And we understand that. And then when we have mental illness or an injury or something, it doesn't work right. Right. There's a way that it does work right and correctly. And there's a logic and a system and the stomach is fucking chaos. Right. <laughs> so it's like Everybody's got different food in there. There are acids that are ripping things up. There's no, it's just, a, it's a passing through point, right? And it's also confused with the uterus mm -hmm. and it's really close to downstairs, right? So it's like this, like just like the depths of like down here, like what bass, I was, this, this conversation is like how I, I used to play bass in a band. And I would always be like, I really don't want people to assume I'm playing bass because I'm a girl. Cause everybody does right. Every band. It's like, if there's a bass, if there's a girl in the band, the only thing she can bother to play is bass, maybe keyboards. But like, I would always just be like, no, no, no. It's because it's the bass, like as a low note is like linked to the, the uterus. <laughs> I just had this whole spiel to protect myself from that comment. Um, but that there is something like just so deep and, and guttural and messy and multi body part and transitionary where the brain, it's all the way up here. It's in its own little space. It's protected by its own little helmet. <laughs> and it's like, it's logical. And so like, if we're making our films from the gut and from the acid, I, I hear you. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing a film right now. That's been 40 years in the making. And there's a part uh, a half hour part that uses the, um, uh, uh, the Duke Ellington piece of the live performance at Newport Jazz Festival in 1956, the menuendo and crescendo in blue, which is a nice piece. And on my own over the last four or five years, I've done these remixes of it for two parts of three part ending. But the last part was being saved to go into surround sound, 7151. And there's this great uh, past student here at Dartmouth uh, that has moved on to one. His name's Carlos Dominguez, a genius with sound, in the sense that I think it's just not even intellectual. I think it's physical, the way we're kind of talking. At least that's why I take it. Anyway, it took forever, three years, to get him to do the remix of this last 12 minutes. And first he did two. You know, it was like pulling teeth. It was beyond pulling teeth. That's a bad metaphor, too, right? But the deal is he did it finally, about a month ago, finally. And I think a lot of it had to do with him competing with Duke Ellington. That was a real problem for him, which is understandable. And also, I can't explain what the film is. But the deal is, now that I've got it and have it in the theater setting and trying to get it mixed just right for the theater, what I've discovered is the minute I stop listening, the film works. Because it works on the levels that we're talking about. It, there's a physical presence to the track now. It has nothing to do with Ellington anymore. Carlos destroyed that, but it, it's the waves of sound coming that do this thing physically to you. And it's an amazing experience. I've never had that in the theater. Closest is Godard when he hits it right. 
you'll get this whirl or something, you know. But this is 12 solid minutes of being enveloped, physically enveloped, not here with the pressure of the room. Which is such a nice response to that festival question of why would you ever do anything like this? Mm -hmm. Like, why would you choose to make a film like this? I think there's always been the, like, compelling devil's advocate in my life in whatever form this person takes, arguing that something like experimental film or video art is not accessible. There's a question of accessibility, you know, a, a movie that is made for the theaters with the narration and everything is speaking a language that we're all taught. And there's this question that I've gotten a lot uh, of, does this sort of sh canon, this shared history of experimental cinema language, make it inaccessible. And I think that there are ways in which certain, you know, modes of curation, certain modes of capitalizing, certain modes of, uh, of sort of taking these things away from the public and putting them into the spheres that we are familiar with, um, that, uh, that can cause problems of accessibility for sure. The thing that I always come back to and I think about is the the real fundamental language that so many of these pieces are speaking are not necessarily coming from purely this idea of canon and this idea of the, the history of the visual language. It, it's also this, this description that um, of, of being enveloped uh, that Bruce just gave us of being of being physically uh, uh, attached to something or physically affected by something and physically immersed in something and there there I I hope I I strive for there is this inherent accessibility in the fact that it is kind of our birthright to speak weirdly with each other yeah. and to <laughs> with each other and exactly why I was nuts when somebody asked me to explain Rose Hobart. <laughs> I've you know, dealt with this since the 70s, this film, and I've never, I don't give a shit what it's about because yeah. it does something else, which is what it's yeah. about. It's okay for it to not be about something. Yeah, I don't think I could explain Rose Hobart. It's funny that you bring this up. I'm like, that is a film that I've always just been like, okay. <laughs> and there that is, and I you like it. leave it alone. You know, it's like sanctified it by leaving it alone. It does its business without me. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, it, yeah, because it, it it runs off of uncanny gestures and it runs off of like a language that you sort of feel like you could grasp in, in the sense that it's it's a, a surreal archival, uh, but in in the also in the sense that uh, you're completely and confounded on a, on a on a repeated basis, and I think that 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 actually begins to 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 bring bring back that whole concept of the why, right? I think that there's like, maybe there's different ways in which artists work up, well, I mean, not that I think that, I, this show proves that, but they're always like, uh, from everybody who comes on, there's there's deep tangents that run together. Um, so I speak, you know, from from the perspective of, of, of a, as an artist, um, there's a strategy to everything. And at the same time, uh, you can't be given to strategy. Uh, there's aesthetics, of course, but the aesthetic function of the work itself is not the thing that motivates the, the work for me, at the very least. And so all of these things seem to, to grow like a plant. And I mean, very, very um, uh, ignorant way of, of speaking about it. I, I speak, the more that I learn about the functionality and the way the more that I learn about the way this grows and the way that this potentially grows within others, that continues to affect both my opinion of the medium itself and then my own strategy as I um, as I contemplate working within it. Um, the strategizing aspect of my brain, uh, I try to get out of the way before the making occurs. Uh, but knowing that there is a sort of part of me that's this, um, uh, as I call myself, a media terrorist or, um, or drug manufacturer and and just, uh, it's also sort of true. Um, and we all are, and speaking of the immersive, uh, that is that, it's, it's the, 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 it's that mixed with what I think Aldo would also 
uh, admire and also um, was maybe in touch with dur during his life in deep ways, this presence of being that is far um, more complex, that's outside of ourselves, that doesn't control us, uh, sorry, that, that, that we don't have that control of the action, but rather that we're brought through the filmmaking process as a means of exploring an idea through a medium. And that's part of the reason why he didn't stick as a filmmaker, right? He was, he was, he was, he was a multidisciplinary artist constantly using new media as a means of, of re-expressing or elaborating upon this um, uncanny element that, that, that would enter in, into his work. He called it the cosmic at, at times, but what, what, what seemed to matter most was that the, the expression of time space through cinema, I, I've been uh, fucking annoying, but I've been uh, trying to make heads and tails of Deleuze and, and what I think of the work. Um, and uh, I, I disagree heavily at, in a knee jerk reaction to certain things that I can't necessarily logically um, wrap my mind around it. And I think it has something to do with the uh, emphasis upon um, these these time images or these these uh, the the motion image the 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 attempts at creating a taxonomy for the um, the work uh, uh, and 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 breaking it down within a, a scientific process that tends to to throw me out. But there is this shamanic practice at, at hand. This is what Wilson Gravidos talks about a lot. Um, Michael, I missed I that, are you speaking of a specific film or in general? No, I'm just speaking in general. I'm speaking, maybe speaking more about the filmmaking process as it pertains to me personally as a filmmaker. Because I think that the, there, there are also ways in which I think filmmakers, uh, you know, there's, the, there's, a, there's a part of my own work, like a tangent of my own work, which is an exploration of these deeper things that I tried to, to figure out the whys to. Right? I try to step with a sort of intention uh, intentionality um, and the strategy uh, of which I, I'm creating this work, but at the same time, there is uh, the work that I, I I know that is more the gut uh, to gut approach that you're talking about. Uh, so, and I also think that the, maybe the good thing for us to end on for our our uh, our last um, minute, like our, our 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 final thoughts, is thinking about that that element of of um, the the critique, the what happens within the critique and what politics are put upon the artists within the critique as well. Um, the, another aspect of the critique that that does what it does is it solidifies sometimes uh, an artist's own relation to their work instead of uh, doing maybe what it's supposed to do, which is to just flip the artist upside down and then to make them think about that work in a different way. Um, so there's there's some negativity that I think enters into that structure of the of the uh, back and forth of the discourse about one's work and one's practice that's uh, I think is un unuseful or unhelpful. But what is helpful is a frustration uh, at the end. So that's my last word. But what I'm going to do is pass it over to anybody who wants to get a last word in. The last person, when you're done, you're going to say bye, and then I'm going to end it just like that. Yes, to say bye. Okay, let's 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 no, throw we have to say we have to say <laughs> bye, e, e. bye. You have to bye. There you go. I want to show you something interesting. I mean, maybe it's interesting for you. I'm in front of the Hood Museum of Art, but I don't know if that's coming across well. Uh, and I forget the artist's name, but it's a play off the Rothko painting that's here. And it's a, uh, I guess you call, I don't know if you still use the term Native American, but he's like throwing his hands up like, well, why? <laughs> Isn't that pretty, can you see it? I'm not sure. Yeah, yes. It's pretty astounding. Oh, it's Kent. His yeah. name's on there, sorry. <laughs> oh, Kent Muckman. Yeah, Kent Muckman's amazing. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that, that's amazing. Sorry to change. I wanted to throw something out back to the epileptics quick. It's not the end thing, but just, just we were talking about the levels of, of stuff. One of the things that always fascinated me personally was that somehow or other, I, uh, a million years ago, found the machine that was used to copy the paper prints. It's, a, it's stored at Ohio State University, and I forget why it's there of all places. And it's a little funky thing. You know, you could make it in your bathtub or something. You know, completely ridiculous. But the deal is this, is while this guy was copying these thousands of pictures and rolls of film, 
He was chain smoking. This Harold Walls guy or Kemp Nye, Kemp Nye, I forget which one. And so what you got happening is he's over this little uh, cine special over a little piece of plexiglass and they're rolling the paper through it underneath. And he's chain smoking over it. So the ashes are also being photographed. So in the epileptic films, you see the epileptics having their seizure and they're like grasping at these white specks, which are the ashes. <laughs> Where's the intentionality there, my friend? <laughs> <laughs> Great moments in cinema. Smith. Great moments in cinema. And it, it gets you in the gut. I mean, literally, you're you're because you're, you're watching this person and you know, you don't know what's going on. I mean, it's actually a pretty straightforward, you know, situation. But the grasping between the grain and the ashes to me says it all. <laughs> Anyways, nice you meeting you. Rename the podcast that. We can yes, name it grasping the three of the grains and the ashes. <laughs> That's pretty good. But it's going to seem like it's all about films about death or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We could do. I could do a whole death film podcast. Um, yeah, but somebody I, really famous like Wittgenstein or somebody like that said that life is not about dying. Good line. It's Ooh. about laughing. It's about I, my, I've got my last word. Go. I'm really hungry, so my last word is going to be stomach chaos. It's one word, and, and it's German. Love it. Stomach chaos. Chaos, right? I don't know. <laughs> it was such a that pleasure to you. talk to everyone. <gasps> yes. You are the last, last word. Oh, and bye. actually, the cat, baby. Bye. Yeah, bye. <laughs> <laughs>